Okay, and I'm passing it over to Clayton and Johanna. Thank, thank you, Nico, so much. Um, we really appreciate the chance to be here today. Um, welcome to Consentful UX. Uh, I'm <clears throat> Johanna Bates. I am co-founder of Dev Collaborative, um, and we are a team that builds websites for nonprofits in Drupal and WordPress with a focus on accessibility and sustainability of content design and code. And I've been a front end developer for 22 years, and I'm particularly interested in accessibility. And that is kind of how this topic, I came to this topic. I came to it from an accessibility lens. Um, and um, it really informed my interest in this. Um, I'm somebody who has a lifelong diagnosis of an anxiety disorder. And because of that, I'm someone who can get very overwhelmed when there's a lot of intrusive or unclear UX on a website or an app. Um, I feel overwhelmed and I may literally never go back to a site or use an app again if I get too flooded with intrusive or confusing or obfuscated things. And that's why I'm here. Um, Clayton? Hi, I'm Clayton Dewey. I'm the product's owner at Dev Collaborative. Um, I've been in this field, I guess, uh, like half, half the time at Johanna, 11 instead of 22. <laughs> I am focusing mostly on user experience design and information architecture. Um, and I was drawn to this topic, um, both because of my focus on usability and designing tools that empower people, and also um, because of my identity as a parent, as a queer person, as a polyamorous person. Um, consent is on my mind and in my practice, in my day-to-day -day life in a lot of different ways and how I show up in my community and in my family. Um, and, you know, even more so right now with the pandemic and navigating how we create safe spaces with each other and, and respecting each other's boundaries and keeping each other safe. Um, this constant, you know, the topic of consent is more important than ever before. And also as we spend more and more time in digital spaces, um, how we take lessons around consent in the date in the face-to-face -face world and how we translate that into the digital world is something that I'm also particularly interested in. So if we um, when we think about user experience design, uh, a good place to start is with a design persona. So design personas are something that were popularized by MailChimp. Um, and Aaron Walter, that's the former designer there. And so this is an example of a design persona pulled directly from, from MailChimp. Uh, so they put themselves here um, in this quadrant of friendly and dominant, you know, far away from the unfriendly side of the spectrum. And then they're using a this, not that framing to describe if their application, MailChimp, were a person, what would they be like? They'd be fun, but not childish, funny, but not goofy, powerful, but not complicated. And if we take this design persona activity and apply it to our own websites and apps that we design and build, we'd come up with something pretty similar, right? Most of us would put ourselves in that same friendly, um, friendly and dominant quadrant. Um, but unfortunately, oftentimes the web is not that friendly. Uh, um, case in point, um, just doing the research for this webinar, I was curious about notifications as a dark pattern, this concept, and so I searched for it in DuckDuckGo, and first result looked really promising, are notifications a dark pattern? Perfect. So I clicked on that link and was excited to start learning. And instead, I'm greeted with this, welcome to the Design Lab blog. What kind of content are you interested in? Well, I'm, I'm interested in the article that I'm trying to read. Okay, so I'm gonna close this out. Now it's time to read the article. Wait, what's in this lower right-hand corner? Oh, they want me to share cookies. Well, I guess I don't really have a choice. I'm gonna click this got it button reluctantly. Okay, now it's time to read this article. Wait, what? Questions about UX Academy? We've got answers. No, I have no questions about the UX Academy. I just want to read the article. Okay, here we go. 
on to read the article. Have you ever had a nightmare where you were literally drowning in little red notification badges? Not, not personally, but I love the I love the hook and I'm reading it and now I'm enjoying it. This is actually a really informative article. Wait, what? Join 45,000 subscribers. Ah, oh, it's another newsletter call out. Okay, back to the article. Okay, informing myself. Wait, what's this? Get your free ebook. No, I don't want this. I move my cursor to leave the site and instead an entire the screen is taken over by another prompt for me to try and download this ebook. So frustrating. Um, it really reminds me of that scene in the movie Airplane where the pilot is trying to get to his flight and he's walking through the terminal. This site uses cookies. We've updated our privacy policy. It's getting a little hostile now. This website uses cookies, review your settings. This site wants to turn on notifications. We noticed you used an ad blocker. And all right, onwards, sponsored content. We wanna know your location, clickbait, Amazon ads. Subscribe to our newsletter modals. They're everywhere. We're constantly being bombarded by these different calls to action other than what we came to the site for. It's exhausting. So if we return back to that design persona that we are aspiring to, are we really friendly and dominant? I feel like it's more in the unfriendly and dominant quadrant here. Yeah, that's a little better. And are we being fun, but not childish or hip, but not alienating? Mm, I'd describe it more like pushy, but not threatening. Maybe entitled, but not full on aggro creeper. And needy, but not desperate. Well, actually, when I moved that cursor to leave the site and they tried to push that ebook on me again, that was actually quite desperate. So, <laughs> so, um, Uh, so with that, um, I'll let Johanna describe, put a name to what we've just experienced. Yeah, so for the sake of exploring consentful UX, uh, we're going to call some of these very normal patterns that we've all become very used to, to the point where we may not even notice them consciously anymore, um, coercive UX. They are UX patterns that manipulate users to try to get them to some, do something that we want them to do. And we're, you know, we see them every day. They include um, not only modals and pop-ups, but also dense terms of service, um, tricky copy on buttons, um, all kinds of um, cookie notifications that aren't really uh, doing their job. So. Um, again, these are starting to see, they've started to seem very normal to us, but when you look more closely, they're actually manipulative. And I actually want to zoom in um, just for a couple minutes on specifically pop-ups, modals, and notifications, um, because they are ubiquitous right now. And I, they are more than just annoying. And I knew this just from being a user on the internet but I wanted to dig deeper and understand why they are so ubiquitous right now and how they degrade user experience. Uh, but before I go there, I do wanna say that there are some good reasons to use these patterns. The alert dialogue is an old concept in software design. Um, and this kind of pattern interrupts the user's flow. It forces them to stop what they are doing. And if it's a true modal where the background window is inactive, um, they force a user to acknowledge the message um, or take some action before they can go on with whatever they were doing. And when this pattern is helping users by grabbing their attention to let them know that something very serious might happen if they proceed, then that's a great use for them. But when they interrupt the user, so often repeatedly, to try to get them to take an action they didn't come to a site to do, it's not helpful at all, it's coercive. And as we showed earlier, even re researching this topic, we encountered plenty of coercive UX. Um, so for example, I wanted to read about whether or not these patterns work for marketing purposes. And so 
here's an article I found about how to use pop-ups to increase conversions. And I was just getting to the exciting part where they tell you how to avoid getting penalized by Google and SEO rankings for using modals, pop-ups, and interstitials on a mobile site. And I'll talk more about that later. But after about 30 seconds, when my brain was good and focused, um, this pop-up opened covering my content. I've got two options here. I can put in my email address, which I love to share, and they can send me everything, which, wow, that's just really appealing, let me tell you. Or I can close this pop-up with a really difficult to see low contrast X in the upper left corner. This is just, when this happens over and over and over again on the same article or successive articles when you're trying to research something or purchase something or use a service, it's exhausting. I have a limited amount of time to read and to focus every day. And getting derailed from my tasks leaves me feeling anxious and stressed. And if it's too excessive, I won't ever go back to the site again. and will leave me with a very bad opinion of the company or organization. But clearly, some people are signing up for this newsletter to send them everything. I don't know who those people are, but somebody's signing up because otherwise, why would these patterns be everywhere? Um, so what does research show about this? Well, Nielsen Norman Group research shows that I'm not alone. Many users hate these patterns. They are among the most hated patterns on the internet. But we use them often because marketing says they work, that they increase conversions. But do they increase conversions? So in researching, I found many articles about how these intrusive patterns do sometimes appear to work. Um, they often produce bumps in particular kinds of metrics um, that I'm gonna circle back to later in the presentation that are sometimes called vanity metrics. Um, and they'll often be an increase in your email list size, more petition signatures, um, higher open rates, or an increase in website traffic to a particular thing that you're promoting. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with these metrics and they can be really useful. Um, but they're a little bit more like robo spam calls. They're, they're using a wide end of a funnel. They're trying to capture as many users as possible in the hopes that some of the conversions that they do get will be meaningful. So again, I'm gonna circle back to vanity metrics a little later. Um, but it's important that if you're measuring those things, you're also asking other questions. How many users did you annoy and lose? How many people entered fake email addresses? And how many sales or donations or meaningful actions did this UX pattern actually result in? And maybe over a longer span of time. Um, and again, um, I'm gonna give you some resources at the end of this presentation for how to craft these kinds of deeper questions in your organization. But back to my point, um, forcing the redirector, redirection of a user's attention is a form of coercion. Um, hijacking visual or mental focus, um, as with a modal, um, obviously it forces someone's attention away from the, their intended focus. It may degrade their ability to engage fully with your content, service, or program. Um, it wears users down, so they may share their information just to stop being harassed. Again, this is a form of coer coercion. Um, another tool that designers use for this is motion. Um, so that's why we see an increasing number of chat bots that like pop up in the corner and they will often have a red notification badge. And for people who can see um, and see the motion and for, for people who can see the color red, um, designers and scientists know, cognitive scientists, that people are wired biologically to respond to motion and the color red if they can see it. And um, even if it's in the periphery of our vision. And so that's why we're getting an increase in this pattern. Um, and you know, when we're doing that, 
we're actually exploiting a biological process of attention in order to redirect a user to do something that we want them to do. And attention is a limited resource, especially right now. So I got this pop up when I was about a minute into reading this article about cognitive overload in the pandemic. And let me just, a momentary aside, the delayed timed modal is just, it's particularly one that really makes me frustrated because I have managed to focus on this article. So I'm like four or five paragraphs in to this article. And um, this pop-up just is like, hey, don't you wanna sign up for our newsletter? And you know, just like a computer, human brains have a limited amount of processing power. When the amount of information coming in exceeds our ability to handle it, we may take longer to understand information. We may miss important details. Did you, did my audio drop? Clayton, did my audio drop? Um, I can still hear you. Oh, okay. sorry, Some, someone lost audio. I will, sorry about that. Thanks for letting me know. Um, okay, so we, if we're interrupted, like I just was, but that was a good reason to interrupt me. Um, <laughs> I may miss important details. I may take longer to understand information and I may get overwhelmed and abandon a task entirely, which hopefully will not happen during this presentation. And people come to your website or your app with different levels of cognitive load already that they're carrying around. So we don't know what users are experiencing when they come to our websites. Maybe they're checking their phone in the bright sun or trying to check their phone um, in the rain on, at a bus stop. Maybe they're in the waiting room of a doctor's office and they're really stressed out and they're trying to read something while they're distracting themselves from something. Maybe they're trying to work while watching a baby, which is a global problem right now and is not easy. Um, when we erode their ability to focus on what they need to focus on, it can easily cause cognitive overload. And they may just give up and leave your site. And in terms of accessibility, cognitive overload specifically affects users with mental health challenges, um, attention deficit and other cognitive issues. People who don't speak the language as their primary language um, that your site is written in. Um, people who are less comfortable with technology. People with a lot of anxiety um, and stress. And I don't know many people who aren't experiencing extra anxiety and stress right now. We're just not respecting users when we use these patterns in excess. Um, and it kind of shows um, users that we don't trust them to engage with us in meaningful ways um, if they do like us. And that's just not a healthy relationship. Coercive UX patterns manipulate users to try to get them to do something that we want them to do. And a great question to ask yourself is, would you do this with someone in person? Um, the Nielsen Norman Group has conducted decades of user research and they know that people find intrusive patterns frustrating. In a usability study, they observed a user attempting to complete a task and after encountering multiple pop-ups, um, he angrily tossed his phone across a table and frustrated, he abandoned his task and left the website never to return with a very bad impression of the organization. <laughs> wow, Johanna, did you say bad impression? That sounds bad for business, but you know what's good for business? My new newsletter, Clayton's Hot Biz Tips. Well, are you gonna sign up and be cool like me or are you just a loser? Um, a loser. I'm a loser, Clayton. Oh, come on. <laughs> All right, fine. Well, next time you and I hang out, I'm asking you if you want to sign up for that newsletter. I'm, Great, I won't take thanks. no for an answer. Okay, so you probably get our point. Um, you know, we just acted out uh, UX and uh, a user having a conversation. And, uh, you know, I'm convinced that we can do better than this. <laughs> 
And so I'm gonna hand this back off to Clayton, who's not gonna give you biz tips, except really good biz <laughs> tips about how to use a framework that will make UX more respectful and more consentful. All right, <laughs> hope all of you have recovered from that interruption. Uh, so, uh, so what is consentful UX? Uh, consentful UX comes from the concept of consentful tech, which came out of uh, the consentful tech project. And um, they have this definition for us. Consentful technologies are digital applications and spaces that are built with consent at their core and that support the self-determination of people who use and are affected by these technologies. Uh, so this was designed, th this uh, was developed by designers and activists and movement organizers who work at the intersection of technology and justice. Um, and I love this definition. And so um, if consent is at the core of consentful tech, um, what does that mean? Well, they build off the definition of consent that's been put forth by Planned Parenthood. And Planned Parenthood came up with the Fries framework, um, which is freely given, reversible, informed, enthusiastic, and specific. Uh, so the Consentful Tech Project mapped each of these principles to digital spaces. So let's take a look at these. The first, it's freely given. If an interface is designed to mislead people into doing something they normally wouldn't do, the application is not consentful. For example, those pop-ups, modals, interstitial videos that we've harped on so far, manipulinks like the coercive copy that was in my newsletter modal, um, auto-playing video or audio. So let's take a look at a few of these examples in the wild. A really common coercive UX pattern is, on, is found on a lot of news sites. Um, so here I am, I've come to this news site. Um, there's some important information about COVID-19 in my community that I'm trying to access. And instead I'm greeted with a newsletter pop-up and the site asking if I want um, to sign up for notific notifications. No, I don't want either of these things. So instead of doing this, um, I really love what Bitch Media is doing. So this is an article that they published. It's a collection of book reviews. And so here I am, I'm reading uh, this book review about the book, Making Friends with Alice Dyson. Uh, I read the review and I come to the end and I naturally, I, I come to a natural end of my reading and I see this call out. Um, to sign up for their newsletter. Uh, what I love about this is that it's not, it's not um, uh, suddenly appearing while I'm in the middle of reading something like Johanna was talking about earlier. Um, instead, it's coming in at a natural time. It's not interrupting my attention, but it's still prominent enough that now I know about this newsletter I and I can choose whether or not to engage with it. Um, another example of coercive UX here again is um, me coming to an article. There's a video at the top, but I'm not interested in the video. So I scroll down to read the article, but the video then follows me down the page. And on top of that, I have these social share icons that are also following me down the page on the left-hand side, and then an Amazon ad off to the right. The content I came here for is squished in the middle and it's very difficult for me to, to read what it is I came here for. Um, so another example, here's some coercive copy on Etsy, almost gone, there's only three left, or on Airbnb, 78% of places in New York for your dates and guests are already booked, you may want to book soon. You know, if this was happening in real life, this would be that pushy salesperson that we hate so much. So in summary, if you have an important call to action, you want users to know about, put it in the flow of content or include it in the header or footer. Those are persistent areas that, that people can see. Um, if have your call to action appear at the end of the article after they've finished reading. Um, and if you're going to use video or audio, make light use of it, make strategic intent, intentional use of it. 
and have a play button that the user initiates themselves and always include a pause button so that they're in full control of that motion. All right, on to the next principle. We have reversible. In technology, you should have the right to limit access or entirely remove your data at any time. This is an important part of consent, right? If we say yes to something once, that is not a blanket yes for all future interactions of that. We always have the chance to change our mind about something. So some coercive patterns around this are no mention of how to, to, how to delete the data that I'm sharing with the service or a website or app, an onerous process for deleting that data, and those ever popular unsubscribe links in the teeny tiny font with the low contrast. So one example, we're going to see just how easy it is to unsubscribe from Amazon Prime. How to cancel your Amazon Prime subscription. Step 1. Go to the Prime Central or Manage Prime membership page. Do not click on memberships and subscriptions. Do not there. click on your account. Don't do Just that click on your Prime membership. Step 2. Look at below and then scroll on down and click End Membership and Benefits. The least prominent Step element. Three, Keep saying you want to cancel through the three-step process. First, click on End My Benefits, and then click on Continue to Cancel. Click to End button to cancel your Prime membership. Your membership has been cancelled and you will see the cancellation confirmed message on screen. Thank you for watching this video. Subscribe to us. Thank you, Friendly Robot, for showing how in just five simple steps you can cancel your Amazon Prime subscription. Wow, that was <laughs> that was ridiculous. Uh, another example of this is um, is that unsubscribe link, and this one was particularly tricky because I have gotten so used to finding that unsubscribe uh, label and quickly unsubscribing. But here, um, Action Network, who I usually love their, their work, but in this case, this coercive pattern is so frustrating. I couldn't find the unsubscribe link for the life of me as scanning, scanning, state disclosures, corporate accountability. Uh, finally, I realized that they intentionally didn't use that unsubscribe label instead. It's to update your email address, change your name or address, or stop receiving emails from corporate accountability. Please click here. And uh, those of us in the in the UX world, we know how much we hate that click here link too. So finally found it. I finally click on the click here link, and I'm taken to this page, where here we go. That that one more act of desperation. Put the yes unsubscribe me button in red. Really, really, was that necessary? I came here to unsubscribe, please. Let's let's drop the coercive UX patterns already. Just please don't do that. So to summarize, make it easy to find instructions on deleting your data don't, and make it easy to unsubscribe from something. On to the third principle of fries we have in forms. So coercive or consentful applications use clear and accessible language to inform people about the risks they present and the data they are storing, rather than bearing these important details in, for example, the fine print of terms and conditions. So some coercive patterns we see. As mentioned in the definition, those dense, unreadable privacy policies and terms of service. Uh, clauses to change privacy policies at any time without notice to users. Or if you have a multilingual audience failing to translate or translating poorly your privacy policies or terms of service. I recently was um, looking into web hosting and found a pretty promising web host, I won't mention their name, uses 100% renewable energy to power their, um, uh, their servers. And the privacy policy was riddled with typos to the point where some of it just did not make sense. 
So make sure that those are, um, uh, yeah, well, well, we'll get into how to do that well. So um, a good example of consentful UX is Firefox's privacy policy page. I love this um, because they take what is typically this really dense legalese and they put it into really plain language and they're using headers or headings here to um, break that into the top level reasons why, why um, we are sharing certain data with Firefox. And they go a step further and they have a link right there to then change those preferences to your liking. Um, which harkens back to that reversible principle of making it easy to, um, to delete data that you're sharing with the service. Absolutely love it. So to summarize, to say yes to something, we have to be fully informed on what we're saying yes to. So make your privacy policy easy to understand. Notify your users when your privacy policy changes. Um, and now there are some legal implications for this under GDPR, the new um, Data Privacy Act in California and, and other states that are following suit. And make sure that your, uh, that your important documents are um, all translated in the languages that your users, your users speak and read. Okay, on to the fourth principle of FRIES. Enthusiastic. If people are giving up their data because they have to in order to access necessary services and not because they want to, that is not consentful, right? We're raising the bar on what we mean by consent. We wanna be excited about saying yes to something. So some examples of this. In the coercive side of things, cookie walls or performative cookie consent that only has an accept button. And those aggressive notifications so let's look at some examples. I've seen some pretty bad cookie walls in my day, but this one might take the cake. We need your consent. Wow, that just flies in the whole in the face of the whole point of consent. Uh, <laughs> and there, you know, all we have is accept. Uh, so no, this is uh, this is not this is not consent. Um, and we'll look at some, some better ways to do this in a bit. <laughs> Notifications. How many of you are on Instagram and have to continue to say not now? I do not want to turn on notifications. Apple has become particularly bad about this as well. If I've said no once, respect that no. If I ever want to turn on notifications, I'll go to my profile settings and I'll turn on those notifications. A much more consentful pattern is what the Allied Media Projects website did. And I love this. And it makes sense because this is an adjacent project to the consentful tech project that this whole consentful technology concept um, arose from. So uh, they have, as you can see in the lower right hand corner, we have this private browsing uh, icon. I'm curious. So I click on that and learn what that means. And I'm shown a, a modal here with this friendly message that we're not watching you, smiley face, loving it already. At AMP, we believe that any browsing information you share should be freely and enthusiastically given. Unlike most sites, our browsing is set to private by default. So here's a big brain, galaxy brain moment. Start without tracking and then have the users opt into it. I love it. So then there is a link there that um, allows me to then say, yeah, okay, I'll share my location with you. I'll share my device information to give you some helpful analytics. I trust you now. We've built a, um, in a short amount of time, we've built a, a relationship of trust. And then um, really funny, I mean, we didn't even plan this originally when we were finding examples, but um, they have a link out there to uh, Firefox as the recommended browser. And I believe that even links to Firefox's privacy policy that tells you more information about why Firefox is a privacy respecting browser. So to recap, rather than those cookie walls and performative cookie consent um, banners, 
you, your site must be functional if you decline advertising and or analytics cookie. This is a semi-recent ruling from GDPR. So um, you cannot force users to accept cookies unless it is core to the functioning of your website or service. And advertising analytics does usually does not um, qualify as core functionality. And then those aggregate Add those aggressive notifications, just don't do them to respect users' notification wishes. And now we're on to the fifth and final principle of Fry's specific. A consentful app only uses data the person has directly given, not data acquired through other means like scraping or buying, and uses it only in ways someone has consented to. Uh, so some coercive patterns for this would be uh, no cookie or generic cookie notification um, or making gender and other personal information required in forms when it's not necessary. Um, and another one I'll throw out there now is with the election season in the U.S. just winding down, I was on so many lists that for candidates I had never even heard of in some cases. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, the, the data sharing um, without consent is, is quite intense. Um, so uh, specific to that cookie, that very generic cookie notification, um, a more consentful example of this is uh, the NHS site here, uh, nhs.uk has a great pattern. Um, when you click on the read more about our cookies link, you're taken to this page, which again, similar to that Firefox privacy policy, they're using headings to make um, what is normally quite dense, complicated information much more manageable. So I see here, cookies that remember pop-ups, cookies that measure website use, cookies that help with health campaigns. I now know which of what these specific cookies are doing and why I might allow them to be set in my browser. And then I can opt in or out of each of those. And if I really want to dig in further, I can click that link that says list of cookies that remember pop-ups and it shows those specific cookies. So I have a fully, uh, fully informed, very specific, a very um, empowering experience here with the cookie settings. So in summary, rather than having a no cookie notification, even if you're setting them or a generic one, design something where you have those specific cookies opt-in settings. And when you're designing forms, ask, what do I really need here? Um, and ask for only only the information that you really need and be particularly thoughtful about which fields you're making necessary. So there you have it, a roundup of Consentful UX. Um, as far as how to apply this in the wild, I suggest we go back to that design persona. It's, it's a really great tool and we can ask ourselves, would I do this in real life, would I do this face to face with other people? And um, how am I, if I put my design persona in that friendly um, side of the spectrum, how can my site be friendly? Also, the closer that we are to our end users, the better the experience is always going to be. So if you have an important call to action, let's say you have an important fundraiser coming up and you really want people to know about it and you wanna strike the right balance between informing them about this, but not interrupting their concentration, uh, run some usability tests, run some readability tests too. Watch people actually read an article genuinely. Are there patterns that you've put in there, designed and developed that are breaking their concentration? And what is the impact of that? Um, so I'll turn it over now to Johanna to talk about working with stakeholders. Yeah, so stakeholders, uh, we have to work with them. Um, it can be really challenging. And um, when we presented this last week um, at a Drupal camp, someone specifically was asking in the Q&A, hey, you know, like, I believe all that, like, I've 
I'm down with this whole thing, but it's really, how do I convince my clients or the board or whomever needs to sign off on the design to get rid of some of these intrusive patterns? And it can absolutely be challenging to do this. Um, as practitioners, um, we often see a better way to do things. And it's really hard when really big giants like Facebook and big box retailers and media sites um, use these patterns. Um, stakeholders will often assume that they've done all their science and they've spent tons of money and they know that they work. So they'll just kind of copy them and they see a bump in metrics and they're like, great, it's perfect. This is awesome. So here are three things that I use um, in order to sort of help move stakeholders along on this issue. Um, the first is SEO. And this is what I go to when I am also trying to get stakeholders more invested in web accessibility. Because um, a more accessible website is often um, uh, has better SEO rankings. And that's something that will often get their attention. And the next slide, uh, SEO um, stands for uh, search engine optimization. So um, thank you so much. Someone just asked what that stood for. So um, search engine optimization is literally like how high in the Google rank are, if someone searches for your topic, like how far up do you appear in the list of results? And often um, stakeholders will be really singularly focused on optimizing SE, search engine opt optimization or SEO in order to get their message heard among all of the other messages out there, which is totally understandable. So um, the next slide, and we'll, we'll make these slides available somehow um, to go with the recording, um, is a resource slide. And I link to resources for all of these things that um, I'm talking about here so that you can go read about them further. But um, in 2017, Google announced kind of quietly that they were gonna start penalizing um, mobile sites that had um, modal pop-up or interstitials on them. So if you have a responsive website and when it's on a narrow screen, you still have a pattern like that, you're gonna get, um, your, your SEO ranking is gonna get dinged and you might appear lower in search results. And so that's usually a pretty, a pretty good argument um, when stakeholders are really worried about that. Um, the next argument is, you know, trust and respect is good business. Um, what kind of organization are you? Um, are your values expressed all the way through everything you do? Are they expressed through your, you know, if you go on retreats or um, have sort of meetings about your vision and your mission and your values, are those really making it out to your programs, your content, and your web design. Um, and, you know, this is another great moment to use that sort of in-person skit kind of thing where you're like, if my web, if, if our brand, our organization was a person, um, if our web UX is a person representing our brand and they're interacting with someone we're trying to talk with on the on the web. Um, what is that interaction like? Um, is it like Clayton's biz tips? Because if so, you may want to revisit some things. <laughs> um, no offense, Clayton. Um, and um, finally, vanity metrics. So I mentioned before that um, vanity metrics are sort of quick, quick bumps in in numbers that people tend to watch. Um, and um, in the next slide, there's a link to a PDF from an organization called Mobilization Lab. And they go into quite, a, in my opinion, a really good, um, more in-depth process for how to create deeper questions to, to track your metrics and success um, in your organization. And I highly recommend checking that out if this interests you. But their definition, of vanity metrics are, is data that are easily manipulated, are biased toward the short term, often paint a rosy picture of program success, 
um, or, and or do not help campaigners make wise strategic decisions in the long term. So again, vanity metrics aren't necessarily bad or useless. This is just a frame for how to look at some of these things in a different way. But if you ask deeper questions about UX, um, and like, are my values being expressed all the way through my UX, um, you may find there are better ways to engage your audience other than by just widening that funnel to capture anyone and everyone in the hopes of making conversions. Unfortunately, this is not a quick fix solution and it's gonna be unique to every company or organization and it will take some time. Um, so yes, I'm sorry that that is a little bit more work, but again, um, in the next slide, um, here are some links and we'll figure out how to make these available to you. Um, and uh, that about wraps up our presentation. Um, thank you very much for um, hanging out with us to talk about this. Um, are there any questions? Because we have another 12 minutes that we can hang out if people have questions. Oh my gosh, Susie just said that Mobilization Lab came out of Greenpeace, which I did not know, and they are resting in peace. I'm very sorry to hear that, but I can tell you that their PDF is still alive and it's really good. <laughs> yeah, it's a great small world moment. So you all are already leaders in this <laughs> in this area in many ways. Um, yeah, and, and somebody somebody made it an interesting point about the the privacy eye icon and how it follows. Yeah, it's kind of stays persistent down the page, and maybe there's a better way of 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 implementing that. And that I mean that is that is the world of UX design, right? Is trying right. something and then iterating over that. And so I'd be curious to see. Um, how it's landing with people right now. And, and maybe it is, um, maybe a more effective pattern would be something where um, you see it, but then you have the option to close and be like, yeah, I got it. This is a privacy browsing site. Or maybe people are okay, uh, are, are fine with it and it's not bothering them because it's slower on the page. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the, that's the fun of it. Um, I also think that, again, like we don't have to, never use any of these patterns, but like, how can we make them a little better? Like it doesn't move, it doesn't bounce up and down. It's not animated um, mm -hmm. that I've noticed. Um, you know, it's, it's like, we are, you know, we're all on the internet. We, some of these patterns sometimes work, sometimes we need to use them. You know, making this an all or nothing framework is not necessarily gonna move us forward um, because there are use cases where some of this does make sense. But as I'm sure everyone has experienced, um, when you feel beleaguered at the end of a day of reading a couple articles on the internet, maybe you're kind of, maybe it's time to reflect on what we're doing. I don't know. Oh, I see the Q&A just open. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I can't open it for some oh, reason. Oh, weird. Um, yeah. I, I, I can read it. Uh, okay. So. Yeah, in response to unsubscribe links, I've seen a lot of companies and organizations moving towards a want to hear less option on this unsubscribe page. So it's not so all or nothing. Yeah, and I've, I've seen this work, I've seen this both work well and not work well. So the consentful approach would be, yeah, maybe there is an option there to, to hear less, um, but there's still that prominent link to just unsubscribe from everything. The coercive pattern is um, either not having that and just showing the, let, okay, you can hear less from us or making that unsubscribe from everything intentionally less prominent and harder to find. Um, but yeah, I mean, that doing that well is, is following that specific principle that we looked at. Um, I also, um, I just wanna say that, I don't know about other people, but I feel like, in the last couple of years, the notion, like I find I'll purchase something or I'll sign a petition or I'll sign up for a list. Actually, I'll purchase something 
or I'll sign a petition. And I will literally make sure that it, that the button, that the box that says send me email is unchecked because I am vigilant about that. I do not want email. And I'm auto subscribed every time. It's like I'm a, it's like when I go to those, those automatic hand dryers that don't see me, it's like that. It's like I'm doing a thing and in a bathroom when you when you put your hands under and those don't see me. It's like I don't exist. I feel like I'm like clicking like don't send me. <laughs> they don't, don't see send me, me email. And it's like whether it's crate and barrel or like some kind of like left wing petition that I've signed, you know, it's like I got absolutely hammered with text during this election season in the US because I live in the US as well. Um, absolutely hammered with emails and texts. And I did not sign up for anything. And I would text stop to every single one and I would just get another one. And I couldn't even tell sometimes if they were the same one or a different one. And I supported these issues. And I know that, you know, it's it's really important to, some of these issues are really important and we're just trying to capture people's attention. It's really hard, but when it makes people angry, it's really something or, or frustrated or feel overwhelmed, it's really worth questioning it. And that's really all we're saying. Yes, amen. I, 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 I'm invisible to those hand dryers and to bartenders. <laughs> it just overlooks all the time. Uh, we got a question from Micah. Do you think it's okay to test and learn with consentless techniques? And then if they make a big difference to our KPIs, so for example, in terms of petition signers, try to improve them in iterations and make them more and more consentful over time. Mm, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think I think this is one of those questions that is, it depends on, on your situation and your users, but I think generally that that's an, a, a good way, an okay way to go for sure. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that my short answer would be, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I'm just, I'm personally just not a black and white thinker on these things. Mm -hmm. um, so, and possibly that's because of my interest in accessibility work. So whenever I talk about making websites more accessible, there, you could do that forever. So, you know, it's it's been most um, most successful um, when I tell organizations to just like, okay, take let's go through your top twenty blog posts and get an intern to add alt tags and headers to like those top twenty blog posts that we know from your Google Analytics are the most read, um, or like we'll just because that's better than doing nothing. And I think that this is the same thing. Um, don't let perfect be the enemy of, of good or better or improving, but that's just sort of my, the way that, cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I agree. Yeah, and one, one other thing I would, I, I would just stress the, the value of doing the qualitative research around this. Um, it's hard to see the, it can be hard to see the quantitative side of the, the impact that these coercive UX patterns have. I mean, as Johanna pointed out, you, you can drive people away from your site if you have too many aggressive coercive UX patterns. Um, but sometimes that's hard to see in the analytics and it's really valuable to, to set up a user test, have someone come to your site have them, you know, come genuinely read an article, read a petition, um, and see, you know, firsthand what that experience is like. Um, and if it's if it's empowering, it's you know, it's really exciting. If you see patterns that are distracting people or frustrating them, then that's a real eye-opening experience, and that can be a really great um, insight to share with those stakeholders who might be skeptical about. Um, about paring down the coercive UX patterns. Um, I think we're almost at time. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Um, Johanna, did you have any final, final words to share? 
No, um, just thank you to everyone and thank you to Greenpeace for um, giving us the space to present today. Thank you, Nikos. Thank you, boss. Yes, thank you. Nice to have uh, And thank you everyone for attending and participating. Uh oh, now's the awkward time where I have to get out of Zoom. <laughs> <laughs>